delighted to be here. Um, I won't, I don't have much time, so there is a paper that uh, I hope you, you can look at it at least. Uh, but uh, I'm going to spend my time trying to convince you of a few things. Uh, one of the things I, I, I will try to convince you, but since you are there, maybe I don't have to, is that despite the very small size of these war-torn countries, it, they are, a, they have an incommensurate weight in the political and security areas. For instance, when I started working on Afghanistan, my economist friends would say, why do you want to get involved in Afghanistan uh, since it's only 0.02% of world economy? And this country has had tremendous implications. It has been at the top of the US a policy, a foreign policy agenda, as it has been in, in many other countries. And it has been the main recipient of aid for many years. So Afghanistan and Iraq, the two of them, they account for only a third of 1%, 0.3% of the world economy. And for the US, this has a cost, the two wars have cost so far $1.6 billion plus all the non-budgetary expenses in terms of uh, pensions, liability, disability liabilities, and other contingent liabilities. So this, this shows, at, at the same time, I mean, Russia and the US have been very close to a new Cold War as a result of Abkhazia and, and some Kosovo and some very small uh, war torn economies. Uh, so, so we cannot think of them as important to the world economy in economic terms, but they are very, very important otherwise. I want to convince you of two things. First, that the international community has been using the wrong recipe and that the results are really awful, not only in terms of what happens to these countries themselves, but in terms of the cost to the international community and the consequences in terms of everything that Omar was saying earlier. So I, I want to, uh, the recipe basically has been to transform these economies, which are very insecure, destitute, and, and polarized coming out of, of uh, internal conflicts into mirror images of developed countries. So we want, liberal democracies and perfect free markets eh, overnight. We want to do that overnight. And it is, uh, why? I mean, some people think it's uh, the dogmatic belief that without being a liberal democracy with free markets, you can't have peace and maintain the peace. Others think it's just to create opportunities for uh, donors, countries, uh, companies, contractors, experts, etc. But the, same, the, the recipe, irrespective of these very different countries, the recipe has been basically the same. We want centralized government, the international community, the foreign interveners have pushed either in the peace agreements or otherwise for centralized government with relatively free elections, keeping the peace through very expensive peacekeeping operations and uh, insurgency operations. To give you an idea, in Liberia, Liberia is one of the countries that had managed to keep some kind of peace, but the uh, peacekeeping operations cost two thirds of Liberia GDP for the three years I studied, which was 2009, 2011. And they were going to close the, the peacekeeping operations then, and it's still going on. So the tremendous cost for the international community. And the, re the recipe has been to save lives, basically through humanitarian assistance, with very little thought of how to make those lives worth living. Uh, finally, the international community has pushed these countries into higher productivity projects, which is fine. I mean, we economists, that's what we long for, but not in economies coming out of these very protected uh, civil conflicts with destroyed economies where a large part of the population, 80%, 70, 80% of the population or more live uh, on subsistence at subsistence agriculture and so forth. So they have ignored that area to push for few productive uh, projects that require large infrastructure that would take time to, to build. Uh, therefore, this 
kind, this kind of policies have benefited foreign investors and a few domestic elites, and they have neglected the large majority of the usually rural population as a result of lack of inclusive and conflict-sensitive policies. In fact, the policies have usually uh, made it worse in the sense that some of these investments in, in concessions, either agriculture or, or mining, they have displaced some of these communities and they have deprived them of their lives and livelihoods. So definitely the wrong, the wrong recipe and the, the results are really awful. I, I take a sample of the countries that have embarked in multi-pronged transitions to peace involving peace, security, economic and social transformation. Roughly 50% of them relapse into conflict and the others have been unable to stand on their feet and become highly aid dependent. The ones that haven't become highly aid dependent in part is because they had an income per capita on average that was beyond the, the threshold to have access to aid. Um, the, the other thing is that, uh, uh, I, I don't want to go over it, that this has had tremendous impact in terms of what Omar was talking earlier. I know you can't see this graph, but it's an incentive for you to look at the paper. But I just want to tell you what the purpose of the graph is. I selected all the operations since the end of the Cold War in which the UN had major multidisciplinary operations, and I chose the 10 first years of, of that operation. And basically, I calculate the aid. And it's very interesting. I, in, the, in the second part, I make an average of the first three years, the, the first five years, and the first 10 years. And what I find is that countries, uh, for the first 10 years, they, they ha they, uh, on average, they get something like 15% to 35% of GDP in aid. But there are countries like Afghanistan and, and, and uh, Liberia that for 10 years, they got over 50% in aid. And this, include, this includes um, a debt relief. But, I mean, tremendous amount of aid, given that many countries like El Salvador and Guatemala, for instance, they had a threshold income per capita above the, the, the one that entitled them to concessionary financing, and therefore they got very little. You can see El Salvador, they only got 4% and 2% of GDP on average on, uh, for the first 10 years. So, so the tremendous indebtedness uh, also, these countries, some of them uh, had peace agreements, others had military interventions. Uh, the issue is that how many of them relapsed? And you know, the, the, the Secretary General in 2005 said that over half. Uh, I did it first. I did it using just my information from from the from the UN for each operation when there was a conflict recurrence and so forth. And I came basically to the same amount, even though two countries were different. But I also used the, 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 um, the um, how, how do they, you, I forgot the name of the uh, UCDP prior index of conflict uh, recurrence, but basically, in the two different, very different ways of, it's 57%. And, and you know, it, it could be much more if, for instance, I change uh, some of the dates which I could justify, uh, then it would be even. But, but it doesn't matter, the figure doesn't matter. What matters is that these countries that start this multi-pronged transition, what people call state building or, or, or nation building, a large part of them, a very large part of them, recur into conflict. And that you see using other index, and, and it has nothing to do with growth. I mean, growth in some countries, it's very high. So the IMF and the World Bank congratulate themselves. For instance, of, of all these, of these 21 countries, you know, um, even though there was no data on some of them, five of them had 
annual growth for the first decade of between 7 and 11 percent. So it has nothing to do with growth, is the lack of inclusive uh, policies and basically the um, the development as usual approach that I will discuss later. What matters in terms of the different index is that some countries like Mozambique, for instance, that receive an enormous amount of debt, of aid, more about 40% the first decade and about 20% the second decade, you know, they're still at the bottom 10 uh, worst countries in the human development index. So something is wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it's not possible to have such bad results. So here I have other indices, and we see that many of these countries are among the main money launderers, and they are uh, 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 some of the most corrupted uh, countries. So basically, what I have been arguing for, for um, 25 years, actually, when I was I was economist in the, in Butros Gali's office at the at the beginning of the 90s. What at the, when when we started at the UN with El Salvador, it was the first time that the UN had a multidimensional operation after it had negotiated the peace agreement, and then it had to. Uh, not only monitor, but also facilitate the implementation of the peace agreement. At that time, at the beginning, we thought, oh, well, this is a very, a country at low levels of development. We should let the, the UNDP and the World Bank lead in the economic area. And then soon we realized that that's not possible because countries, first, to move from the economics of war to the economics of peace, they have to carry out, of course, many of the development activities that were interrupted during the war, but they also have to carry out all peace-related activities that are very expensive. I mean, Keynes' dictum after the, the, the Versailles Treaty was that, you know, peace has economic consequences. And in the, in the aftermath of the Cold War, eh, the... the, the um, um, the IMF policies of tight monetary and fiscal policies uh, trumped over um, Keynes' dictum. So uh, these countries were following a very, today we heard of the neoliberal um, Washington consensus policies and all that. So these countries were on the one hand having those policies and at the, on the other hand they were trying to implement peace agreements that had fiscal and financial consequences. And that created, for instance, nine months after the signature of the Salvadorian peace agreement, the, the agreement was close to collapse because the arms for land program could not start because of lack of resources. So basically, my argument is that this economics of peace or economic reconstruction or economic transition, whatever you call it, it's, it's something intermediate, it's, it's a transitory phase, it's, it's an intermediate phase in which you have to be very careful to have conflict sensitive and inclusive policies to ensure that the, the country does not relapse into conflict and therefore you cannot have, you cannot expect to have optimal uh, first best economic policies from an economic point of view. And this was highly um, rejected by the World Bank at the time. We had, an even, and the IMF, and there were lots of problems because of our work with Alvaro de Soto between the IMF and the UN and all that. But since then, we've been arguing that this, to, to have optimal first best policies was not even desirable, not, nor possible under these uh, situations. And this is something that finally Zelik, the, the World Bank president, accepted in 2008, uh, saying, yes, we thought this was harder, uh, we thought that the, the, this was harder cases of development, but now we realize that you know, this is more than harder cases of development. This is a totally different situation because unless you have 
this set of policies which are peace, relate, uh, peace uh, reinforcing, then you are likely to go back. And if you go back, you know, you cannot have development, sustain, sustainable development without peace, uh, which means that the peace or political objectives should always prevail over the economic or development objective. When the two clash for resources, which is normally the case. So basically, um, <laughs> take an extra minute if you need. One, one extra minute. Okay. So basically, this is my what I uh, what I want to do. But let me. Uh, and I said all that. But basically, uh, what I do in the paper, I discuss the the four different uh, aspects of the transition, and I think it's very important because, for instance, all these aspects, the security, the political, the economic, and the social, social meaning uh, reintegration of these former combatants and other uh, armed groups into society and into productive activities, all these things have been discussed separately. And it's been a big problem because, for instance, uh, you know, these uh, US policies of peace through a uh, military, it hasn't worked, you know, the expeditionary economics and all that. It's been extremely co costly and it hasn't worked. So basically what I argue in this paper is that after following the, the, the um, when they adopted the Marshall Plan, there was a very wide ranged debate on how reconstruction should take place. So what I do in this paper, I said, well, you know, it's been 25 years and it hasn't worked. So we have to change. And this requires a, a comprehensive uh, debate on how to move forward, on how to make this new paradigm that it's not development as usual, how do we make it operational? I mean, it, it, the countries have to change, but also the organizations that support them have to change. Uh, so, so basically, I, I present a number of questions that, uh, on which we should have a debate, and the debate should not be based on these silos that you know the economists discuss with economists and military people with military people, but. There should be integration because all these aspects of the transition have been extremely interrelated. And those inter the reverse causality that we economists call has been ignored in much of the, uh, not only the, the analytical work, but also uh, the policy uh, in these countries. Thank you very much.